Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Researching Urban Ancestors in the 19th and 20th Centuries. My name is Ginevra Morse, Vice President of Education and Programming at American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society. I will be your moderator for today's program. This program is brought to you by the Brew Family Learning Center. American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and our donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history and are pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. I also want to note that we are still broadcasting from our homes to your home with various limitations and distractions. We apologize in advance if there are any interruptions from our end and we thank you for your patience. If we were to lose connection, uh, not to worry, you will still have access to a full recording on our website and our YouTube channel. So our presenter today is researcher Danielle Kornoyer. Uh, Danielle studied history at the University of the Incarnate Word in uh, San Antonio, Texas, and earned a master's in history from the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Before working here at American Ancestors, she worked at the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston, and the Church of the Presidents in Quincy, where she led guided tours of the historic church and the Adams Crypt. She has also worked with the Arlington Historical Commission, researching and drafting a proposal for the designation of a historic district for the town. Danielle's interests include the history of urban development, transit, and Western migration in the United States. So in the 19th and early 20th centuries, American cities seemingly sprang up overnight as new industries, new immigrant populations, and new opportunities blossomed. Finding your ancestor in a growing metropolis can be sometimes tricky, and today Danielle will discuss some of these key sources and techniques for researching your urban ancestry. At any point during the presentation, feel free to type your question into the panel, into the question panel, to the right of your screen. We'll address those at the end. There is a syllabus for this session that can be purchased from our online bookstore. You'll find a link to this downloadable PDF in your reminder emails as well as in your follow-up email after today's broadcast. Uh, but as I mentioned, we are recording this event and starting uh, tomorrow you can freely go back and review any of the content from the presentation on our website as well as our YouTube channel. So if you miss something on today's first listen, don't worry, you can always go back and review the presentation later. All right, so without further ado, I will turn things over to Danielle. Thank you, Ginevra. Uh, welcome everyone to today's webinar. The turn of the 20th century was one of the most momentous and dynamic periods in American history. The years between 1870 and 1914 set in motion developments that would shape the country for generations. When doing urban genealogy research, it is valuable to understand the circumstances that governed your ancestors' world. For as cities grew and changed at, this rap at a rapid clip, so did the ways in which Americans kept records. Knowing how different communities lived and worked in their urban surroundings can better help your research, you research your ancestors. The years of industrial expansion after the Civil War brought significant transformation to American life. New innovations led, new modes of mass, uh, led to new modes of mass production and the expansion of telegraph and rail lines allowed for the unprecedented movements of products, people, and ideas, which led to the rapid growth of industry and shifted the country from an agricultural society to an industrial one. And of course, cities attract industry and industry attracts people. The industrialization of America led to incredible population growth in its urban centers. U.S. cities grew by nearly 15 million people in the two decades before 1900. By 1900, 40% of, of Americans lived in cities as opposed to 20% in 1860. This shift in the American economy and the resulting ascendancy of wage labor not only changed how Americans earned their incomes, but also how they lived. 
For the first time in the nation's history, wage earners had come to outnumber the self-employed. This brought forth the rise of consumerism and the development of a middle class. For this emergent, emerging middle class, new conveniences such as public transportation, electric lights, indoor plumbing, and department stores made urban life easier for those who could afford it. For the poor, however, including thousands of new immigrants, the cities were not as welcoming. Learned by the promise of higher wages and better living conditions, people flocked to the cities to find work, mainly in manufacturing, slaughterhouses, and textile mills. But with progress comes its challenges. The rapid growth, the rapid rise in wealth and modernization overshadowed the, overshadowed, uh, overshadowed the adversities caused by rapid industrialization and urbanization. Abuses and corruptions in business and government in the late 19th century caused, for, caused hardships for American immigrants and laborers and would lead to large-scale movements for progressive labor laws and regulation. As people flooded the cities to find work, cityscapes transformed to accommodate them. New immigrants found community with those of familiar, familiar culture, religion, language in crowded downtown streets while the newly established middle class took advantage of new transportation networks to reside in new communities built just beyond the city centers, the forerunners of today's suburbs. In the years before the Civil War, immigrants to the United States largely originated in Northern and Western Europe, arriving from the British Isles, particularly Ireland, and Germany, Scandinavia, with smaller numbers from China and Mexico settling in on the West Coast. Beginning in the 1870s, after the Civil War, however, American cities began to see the arrival of more immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe. A combination of deteriorating economic conditions, war, and religious and ethnic persecution compelled the immigration of hundreds of thousands of Greeks, Italians, Poles, Russians, Serbs, Turks, and Jews from the Austrian Hungary from Austria Hungary and the Russian Empire. Thousands of these arrivals found home in crowded rental apartments or tenement housing in these enclave neighborhoods where many immigrant groups struggle to hold on to their customs and traditions. Even today, you can still see the ethnic heritage of many of these neighborhoods in cities across the United States. Some earlier inhabitants of American cities saw some upward mobility during this period. These individuals were able to take advantage of innovations in mass transit like trolleys and cable cars and move to new neighborhoods just beyond the city borders. These streetcar suburbs led to the birth of a new American commuter working class, those who lived in the suburbs and traveled in and out of the city for work. Here you can see a map of the incredible web of streetcar lines in 1907 Los Angeles. The population of LA grew from just under 6,000 residents in 1860 to over 1,000 residents or 100,000 residents in 1900. And by 1920, nearly 580,000 people would call the city home. Developers took advantage of this new trend and began to buy up large tracts of former farmland on the outskirts of cities for the development of housing subdivisions, where for the first time, this new commuter middle class could afford to purchase a single family home. After the subdivisions were surveyed, developers would file plat maps like of their new neighborhoods with the city and the county like the one here on the bottom left for the Hendersonville neighborhood in the Boston suburb of Arlington. On the right, you can see a newspaper announcement advertising a new neighborhood on the outskirts of Cincinnati, just a 15 minute walk from the Norwood rail station. There are both pros and cons to urban family research. While the potential of finding record of your ancestor is higher, there's often a lot of red tape and records to sift through. I want to discuss some things to remember when doing family history research in urban areas. First, no two cities are the same. Each has its own history, geography, ethnic groups, and commercial interests. Exploring the cultural and economic makeups of your city of interest may very well lead you to new clues during your research. 
Different cities kept different records and had different record keeping practices. Municipal offices like city clerks or assessor's offices can often be hard to access, but overall cities offer better and more centralized research facilities like libraries, archives, and historical societies. The key to maximizing your research efforts in densely packed urban neighborhoods is to know what exists and where those records are held. Civic records are, of course, some of the most sought after records in genealogy. They include vital and probate records and normally act as the foundation in our research. While civic record keeping began earlier and was usually more organized in, uh, in cities, the multi-layered bureaucracies that were created as a city grew can often make research more difficult. A record of one event could have been filed by multiple offices or departments complicating research efforts. Vile record filed at both the city and county levels may often contain slightly different information. One copy may provide addresses while another may give, give ages and occupations. It is important to research and learn what civic structure existed for the city and period of interest and then where those records are preserved today. As an example of complex civic record keeping, prior to 1908, the New York City Department of Health was the only civic office where marriage certificates were filed. But if a couple was married by a minister, the church might also maintain a copy of the marriage. This 1907 church marriage certificate was passed down in a family for over 100 years. But by locating the Department of Health's copy, we found much more information about the couple that was, about the couple that was not included on the church's copy. After 1908, things got a little bit more complicated for people looking to marry in, in New York City. From 1908 to 1937, the health department continued to record marriages as it had before, but the city now also required couple, couples to obtain licenses and certificate from the city clerk's office in their borough. Consequently, there are two entirely separate civic records of a marriage for the couples who married during this period the health department certificate and the city clerk's license and certificate. The key is determining where the civic record was filed and then where it is now. City or county uh, courts and clerk's offices were often where the civic documents for a person were generated, but could be maintained by a completely different office today. Some records may be in a city hall, a city or state archive, a health department, or maybe even archived in a library or historical society, depending on their age. Cities may also have their own unique civic record collections relating to things like city employment, schools, welfare assistance, elections, military activity, jails, and law enforcement. Each of these government generated records can be held at a different location or in multiple locations, depending on the time period and the city. Due to the density of records, today New York City maintains its vital records separate from the rest of New York State. Founded in 1950, the New York City Municipal Archives today houses the largest collection of birth, marriage, and death records for New York City. The archive is also the largest local government archive in North America. Despite this, other collections still exist in local courthouses and archives across the five boroughs. You can see here, the long gaps that exist in the dates of the compiled city vital record collection at the municipal archives. If you're looking for a record that isn't covered in these ranges, you will need to determine where else that record could be. Many of New York City's vital records that are today maintained by the municipal archives have been digitized by, the, by family search, but are only available to browse at a family history center. So cast a wide net in your search and start local. In a bit, we'll talk more about how to learn more specific more specifics about the neighborhood your ancestor lived in and the communities they were a part of. The municipal boundary, the municipal boundaries of an urban area shift over time as the cities grow. In the 19th century, this happened just as often or even more frequently as county lines changed in rural areas. 
Therefore, it's important to note when your ancestor's particular neighborhood was annexed into a modern city. One city can be divided into many parishes, wards, or precincts, and these divisions can impact where you look for records. A prominent example of this is, of course, New York City. Between 1870 and 1898, as New York City grew, in an effort to consolidate local government, the independent cities that today make up the five boroughs, Manhattan, Brooklyn, Queens, the Bronx, and Staten Island, were each annexed one by one into the greater city of New York. While consolidated, the city today still spans five counties, New York County, Kings, Queens, Bronx, and Richmond County. While all these, while all these counties borders mostly align with those of the five boroughs, they, uh, and they have no county government, each borough still does retain some level of local governmental authority and representation. Similar to New York City, some prominent Boston neighborhoods were also once independent municipalities. Some of the most notable being Roxbury, Dorchester, including present-day Mattapan and a portion of South Boston, Charlestown, West Roxbury, which includes Jamaica Plain and Roslindale, Brighton, which includes Alston, and Hyde Park, which all became part of Boston at different times. Finally, as always when doing genealogical research, you need to watch out for cases of widespread record loss. Upsetting as it can be when it happens in a rural county courthouse, there, can, there have also been a couple famous instances of the destruction of, a dec of decades worth of city records during this period of incredible growth, urban population growth. The 1871 Great Chicago Fire destroyed all civic records for 1831 to 1871 and the great 1906 San Francisco earthquake devastated its city hall and all the records inside were largely destroyed in the earthquake and, it, and the subsequent fire. When such record loss is the case, local libraries and historical societies have often worked to compile record substitutes from the few surviving records and other resources, most notably cemetery and newspaper records. These collections are widely found on, in online databases and in published resources. In such prominent cases, such as Chicago and San Francisco, many re research manuals have been published to help you be productive in your research. It's not just the governmental boundaries of a city that change as the populations grow. The physical geography of a city can also see radical transformation. While many coastal cities across the country, like New York, New Orleans, Chicago, Seattle, and San Francisco, all saw some similar land-making projects in the 19th century, in Boston, where the city's small peninsula, peninsula could not keep up with its swelling population, by the end of the century, major land-making projects had more than doubled the size of the city. Some of the filled coastal bays became housing for working class, while Boston's wealthiest citizens constructed new modern townhomes along the grid streets of the new Back Bay neighborhood, moving away from the growing immigration, immigrant population of Beacon Hill and the North End. The change in physical geography can also happen in reverse, when a whole neighborhood, once very crowded and busy, are today lost to time. The destruction of entire neighborhoods during urban renewal projects of the 20th century changed city landscapes and where whole populations lived and worked. Neighborhoods like Chicago's Mecca Flats, Detroit's Black Bottom, and Chicago or Los Angeles's Chavez Ravine were all demolished and, mo and their mostly minority working class inhabitants pushed out. Here you can see evidence of a textbook example of this neighborhood loss, Boston's West End which at the turn of the 20th century was a neighborhood with a, a large and prominent immigration po immigrant population. The entire neighborhood was completely lost to urban redevelopment in the 1960s. In addition to record, government records, urban researchers can take advantage of other types of records that served a more everyday role in an urban community. Resources like city and business directories, as well as daily published newspapers were produced sooner and disseminated more widely in cities than in rural communities in order to spread information in dense and busy neighborhoods. While these kinds of records played a more practical role at the time of their publications, today we can use them to learn more about the landscape and communities our ancestors lived in.
A city directory works as a snapshot that pins your ancestor to an exact place in time. They are a resource that allows you to fill in the gaps between census years. This is, of course, most true for those crucial years between 1880 and 1900 left open by the loss of the 1890 federal census. City directories were published in some American cities as early as the 1780s, but were printed much more and more frequently as the city populations began to rise in the second half of the 19th century. The last decade has seen the digitization of directories for cities across the country and the creation of many online collections. Some of the most prominent, prominent collections being included at Ancestry.com, Fold3, Google Books, and the Internet Archive. You can also find physical and digital copies in person at, the, at, the pub, at public libraries in their local history rooms and in university collections. City directories served a functional purpose in the community. They were how people found each other. Need to find a carpenter or a tailor or the doctor recommended by your neighbor? What's the address of your son's teacher? Even who's your local councilman? An individual living in the in 1890s could turn to their local city directory to find who or what they needed. The often large hardcover books alphabetically list the individual with their occupation, work address, and or home address. The names of their wives were also often included in parentheses in the entry for their spouse. Directories typically only included people with an occupation. They would not normally include individuals working in a home, such as domestic servants, unmarried women, or the unemployed. But this did change in some cities as time went on. Directories may also reveal clues for dates of marriage and death if an individual or if an individual has moved out of town. Here in the 1893 city directory for Burlington, Vermont, you can see an entry for Amanda W. Beach, the widow of William E. Beach. If you were unable to locate the, the death record for William, following Amanda year to year in the directory will help, may help you pin down the year William died. Meanwhile, listed below Amanda, it looks like E.S. Beach had moved from Burlington to Worcester, likely since the directory's last publication. City and business directories were published semi-annually in both large and small urban areas, but could also include businesses in outlying communities. Be sure to make note of the publication date usually found on the cover. The information was typically collected by the publisher through door-to-door -door canvassing over a certain period. This San Antonio City directory is titled to cover 1901 to 1902, but you can see on the title page here that the information was actually collected over 26 days in November 1900. Like for any kind of genealogical record, there's always room for human error. With the uncertainties that may happen with door-to-door -door can canvassing, always search the years around the date you know your ancestor was res residing in the area and watch out for irregularities. When using city directories, don't always skip to the name list. Directories can also include a wealth of other information about life in the community your ancestor was living in. Some directories can act as a year-to-year -year detailed local histories of a place on the of a city on the rise and provide information on its prominent citizens. The pages before or after the name directory may include important details like ward or district boundary descriptions or maps that that we can that can come in handy when doing census research. We'll talk more about that in a bit. When you reference the city directory, make note of the general index near the start of the book to see everything it has to offer. City directories include lists of churches, hospitals, schools, and government offices, which may point you in the right direction of where to look for family records. Although directories benefited an entire community, they were often used by those in business to identify and market to potential customers. Advertisements can show what was important in a community and vital to the local economy. You can see here from this advert printed in the Honolulu City Directory that tourism was big in Hawaii even in 1890.
an example of how a directory can be useful in your research. If a church your ancestor attended is unknown, an identifying their specific address using a city directory can help narrow down which churches they were most likely to have attended. And if a marriage record names a minister, using a directory to find the church that they were the pastor of may lead to the location of further family records. Here you can see the state registration of the 1899 marriage of John V. Meehan and a Mary A. Murphy. This record provides that the couple was married by M.J. McCall of Salem. Using the 1899 Salem City Directory, we located a list of clergymen in the city and identified Michael J. McCall, a Roman Catholic minister working at 161 Federal Street. Turning to the name directory gives us further details for McCall, recording him as a priest at St. James Catholic Church. Now, you are able to turn to the church's Church's Registers of St. James for further record on the family of John Meehan and Mary Murphy. When available, a reverse directory within a city directory can be used to identify friends, associates, and neighbors. Reverse directories list individuals by street address instead of alphabetically and generally distinguish the name of the homeowner of each address, which is helpful if you're doing property research. They are most useful to pinpoint all individuals who relied, resided at a certain address. You may also be able to identify potential coworkers and employment trends by comparing the occupations and the employers of those who live in the same neighborhood. Another type of public local resource are city and town annual reports. These pamphlets or books contain detailed information for a given city typically for, one, for a one year period. Published by the local governments, these reports contain information on local budgets and often include vital statistics for the year. While these reports are not as frequently digitized as city directories, they are often key parts of local history collections in public libraries. And more recently, some libraries have made their annual reports available online in the internet archive. Like city directories, annual reports can include other interesting topics that give you further insight into the functioning of a city that your ancestor lived in. Such as information on local schools, often listing teachers and their salaries, and sometimes even student lists, cemetery reports, charity and support given to particular residents. Here on the right, you can see a list of individuals residing at the local almshouse. They also can include road and public works projects and other town related data that the city officials felt worthy of being included. Moving on, you can take a second look at census records when doing urban genealogy. When a general online census search fails to turn up your ancestor in a densely populated city, it may be daunting to perform a manual search to locate them among the hundreds of census pages. One technique is to locate elusive individuals in census records is by using their street address provided in the city directory. The key keyword search tool on Ancestry.com is useful to search by a street name. You can see an entry here for Pemberton Square in Boston's 1880 census, noted along the left side of the page. The ward number, Ward 10, is noted above. Did the enumerator not note an address? Unfortunately, the inclusion of street names and addresses depends on the census taker. Sometimes they simply did not make note of the address of each household when they were doing their door-to-door -door canvassing. In this case, you can vastly narrow down your search by figuring out what ward or district your ancestor was living in. Censuses for large urban areas between 1880 and 1950 were broken up by ward or district. An enumeration district or ward is an area determined by what could typically be covered by a census taker within a one census taking period. You can browse the census by ward, by ward or district on Ancestry.com. 
If the census taker had not run down Pemberton Square during his enumeration, we could turn to the 1880 Boston City Directory to find the correct ward in either the street guide or the ward boundary sections. The website of Steve Morse offers multiple online tools that are incredibly helpful for genealogical research. He has a one-step tool that allows you to determine the, determine the 1880s to 1850 enumeration district if you know the person's address. When it comes to genealogical research in any area, Newspapers can offer a wealth of information about your ancestors and their community. Advancements in printing and communication technologies in the latter half of the 19th century led to a rise of local newspapers being published daily in cities across the United States. The daily publication of urban neighbor newspapers allow for the appearance of marriage and death notices much more consistently than in rural papers. In cities, different newspapers competed to be the first to publish news of events, both local and national, including details that are of great interest to family researchers today, such as school announcements, probate court proceedings, and legal announcements, and the coming and going of people visiting family and friends. Probate and estate notices can be particularly helpful when you're trying to determine if a probate record exists. These announcements can often help narrow down your probate search by providing the date and date in the court the record was filed in, and the names of the administrator and other people involved in the probate of the state. Today, city newspapers have been widely digitized and are available online. These online newspaper databases are gratefully often text searchable. Some of the most popular na uh, large national databases are newspaper.com, genealogybank.com, the Library of Congress's Chronicling America site, and newspaperarchive.com. In addition to these national new, uh, databases, it's very likely that there are newspaper databases unique to the city or state you're researching in. Always check city, state, and university libraries and archives for more local digitized newspaper collections. Some quick tips for searching online newspaper databases if you're having trouble locating your ancestor's name printed in a newspaper, try these alternate searches. Instead of William Ter Terry, try the abbreviation WM or Mr. Terry. And instead of Yvonne Hatton, try Mrs. Hatton. You can also try searching by a street name or address or even a business name. When doing genealogy, maps can help you envision your an ancestor's surrounding landscape. In urban settings, they are excellent tools for discovering what a person's life may have been like in regards to things like transportation, mobility, business and occupation, and even food supply. Often offering different information based on the purpose the map was created for. Some of the earliest American maps were surveys showing geopolitical boundaries and dividing property lines. But in the late 19th century, there began to be a commercial effort to publish land ownership maps and atlases for a wider audience. The publishers of these large atlases sought to create incredibly detailed maps indicating location of the location of individual dwellings and sometimes the name of their owner. Some atlases covered an entire city, providing a block-by-block -block view broken down by ward. Other county atlases, atlases, however, were less detailed, providing several inset plans of only principal cities or towns of the county in detail. The typical atlas also depicted roads, railroads, churches, schools, important public buildings, as well as rivers and other major waterways. By utilizing the street index towards the front of the atlas, you can easily find the neighborhood you're looking for. These kinds of survey maps are particularly useful for researchers tracking the changes in a neighborhood or even a specific neighborhood or property. Here's an example of how these published atlases allow us to see the developments of one neighborhood in the Boston streetcar suburb of Arlington from 1875 to 1898 changing from a former farmland with warehouses into a diverse neighborhood of about 100 homes. In 
In the years after the Civil War, maps became a popular way for governments to visualize and communicate environmental and biographical statistics and data. Statistical maps were used to track trends in population, health, language, immigration, religion, and even weather. They can pro provide genealogical research with a unique information and clues that may help in your family research. Here you can see an illustrated, dens uh, illustrated density map for the immigration population of New York, published by the Tenement House Committee in 1890, showing the patterns in, patterns in where different ethnic groups settled in the city. You can see the thick dark line showing that the quote unquote natives lived uptown while the dense and diverse immigrant population crowded into Manhattan's Lower East Side. Here's the second example of a statistical map noting all the cases of malaria documented in homes along the Alewife Brook Parkway in Cambridge between 17 97 or 1897 in 1903. The neighborhood depicted here is the same one we tracked a couple slides back and shows how a staggering 50 homes in the neighborhood have been touched by malaria in just those six years. Some of the most useful maps for genealogical research are Sanborn fire insurance maps. These maps were published from 1867 to 2007 and allowed fire insurance companies to assess their total liability in urban areas. They included comprehensive plans of a city, including detailed surveys of each property. They show the location of every building and any outbuildings, as well as windows and doors. Using a color-coded system, the maps then note the composition of each building's materials, including framing, flooring, and roofing material. When using these maps in your research, make sure to make note of the key to decipher the symbols used to designate every detail on the map. In addition to marking house numbers, streets, and sidewalks, Sandborn maps often also note it, notate a building's use sometimes even the use of a particular room, as well as the names of most part, uh, public buildings, churches, and businesses. On the left, we have the Sanborn survey of Coney Island in 1906, showing the wooden roller coasters and brick dance halls. On the right, you can see the various building materials used, in just one, used to build just one block in 1884 Seattle. The Library of Congress has a very large Sanborn map collection available online. Today, you can find countless map collections online, as well as new and advanced tools for georeferencing historic maps and photographs over modern maps. Today, so, today some of the largest online collection map collections can be found at the Library of Congress, David Rumsey's map, map collection, Historical Map Works, the Boston Public Library's Norman B. Le, what, Leventhal Map Center, the New York Public Library's New York City Space and Time Directory, and at the University of Texas at Austin. As we have covered, urban research during the late 19th and early 20th centuries can be quite daunting, but the resources available are incredibly worthwhile if you just know where to look for them. So learn your city. Every city is different, and while we've covered some sources that can be found across cities in the US, it is important to learn what offices and resources exist for the specific city you're researching in. Remember, civic record collections can be housed at the city, county, state level, or all three, depending on the period and the type of record. Always make use of the knowledgeable reference archivists at the local and city, archive, or the city and state archives. They are well versed in what is and isn't in their collections and may be able to point you in the right direction. Reference desks in archives today are widely accessible via email. The research wiki available at familysearch.com is a great place to start your research. The database in, gives insights as to what records are available by location. Take a look before diving into a new city, but also remember to see what's available at the county and state level too.
And if you are able, look local. Local libraries in cities and their suburbs often have distinct local history sections where many of the most useful resources for family research have been cataloged in a central place. In the same vein, university archives can also be a great source for urban researchers. They, have, they may have resources unique to the city that are not yet available online. Then there are, of course, the local history societies. Oftentimes, you will find that a large city may have more than one. Check for local neighborhood associations. These oftentimes smaller organizations have self-published resources that are not widely available. While researching your ancestors who lived in the crowded American cities during the turn of the 20th century can often be daunting, a vast number of resources are out there for you to find unique to each city. Cast a wide net and discover what each city has to offer. All right, well, thank you, Danielle, for your presentation. So let's uh, take some time for questions if you have something that you'd like to ask Danielle about anything that she's presented. Um, go ahead and type it into the questions panel. Um, so Tony says, uh, when I first came across city directories, I thought phone books without phone numbers. Um, so for later, you know, in the in the 20th century, what happened to those phone books? Um, have any been digitized or available online? Uh, for phone books, I have weirdly come across some digitized phone books available in different collections. I have I can't think of any off the top of my head, but I do remember coming across one once, I believe for the 18 or for the 1970s and finding that kind of surprising. But I imagine that maybe as time goes on, that could be a resource that we start using to research uh, maybe in 100 years our grandchildren will be looking for us in the 1890s uh, phone books. Um now, a few questions. Uh, so Helen asks, um, if you know, when did the city of Boston start requiring business registration and licensing or around what period? And where could those records of businesses and business registration um, be found? I don't know if I could give an exact date. Uh, in Boston, it could have been as early as the 1700s. Um, but the city archive is definitely where to look for those. Um, they have a great reference archivist. I definitely look up, uh, recommend going to their website. It's on part of boston.gov and reaching out to them. They will definitely either be able to help you or point you in the right direction. All right, and um, one person also mentioned that the Library of Congress has a great collection of digitized phone books. So certainly something to, yeah. to look at if you're interested. It's probably where I saw it. <laughs> um, let's, uh, okay, so we have a question. Can you explain the difference between boroughs and counties in New York City? How are they the same? Are they different? Are the boundaries different? What can you say? So it's complicated as we kind of saw there. Uh, originally these boroughs, uh, Bro Brooklyn, for example, was a ton of different towns. And over the 19th century, it came just the city of Brooklyn that made up Kings County. Um, when Brooklyn was uh, brought into New York City, it became part of New York City, not just Brooklyn anymore, but it's also still Kings County. Uh, they're, those count, the borders of these counties mostly stay within the borders of the boroughs like Queens County next door to Brooklyn, uh, in Kings and King and Queens County mostly share those same, uh, the same boundaries as the boroughs they represent. Um, why there are county uh, distinctions, I believe is a representation thing um, and goes down to city councils and uh, different local ordinances. Um, there's a lot of bureaucracy in New York City because of the population size and because uh, how dense but sprawling the city is at the same time. And I believe that that's probably why they break, break them down even that way. Um, now, a few folks are asking about, um, you know, when vital records are kept. Um, and how far back they go for various cities. Uh, and that obviously, as you mentioned, that's really gonna depend on the city. So 
how do you, is there a resource that you go to to kind of learn uh, when, say, vital records or other records um, would start to be kept for a city? I definitely would start with the Family Search Wiki. Um, you can you can start by the state level. Um, for example, in New York State, uh, it's 1881 uh is when vital records started being mandated or you had to keep them at the state level um and but then you can go down to the county did westchester county start starting start keeping vital records sooner than new york state or was their compliance slow so you can break it down state county city level um in new york i think you can in new york city you can also break it down by borough too um if you're going into the city um, but definitely, yeah, you need to look as closely as you can at the place that you're looking at. Um, and yeah, I would definitely start with the Family Search Wiki. That will give you a good place to or give you a good time frame of to know when something should be there or not. Uh, now, Rob has a or says, you know, my grandparents owned a bakery in the Bronx. Uh, I don't know the name of the bakery. What's a good place to start a search? Oh, that would be fun. I would do uh, maybe city directories would be a good place to look. Uh, a business directory is either part of a city directory or a separate thing, a separate book itself. Um, but if you know kind of the, the, the year range that they were running that bakery, take a look at different bakeries in the Bronx and see if, uh, look up your grandparents in the city directories and see if they list a business name, a business address. And then you can go search uh, in the street directory to see what is at that address. And maybe it will give you the name of the bakery. Um, once you have an address, it would be then fun to turn to um, the Sanborn maps and see what was around that business, what your grandparents' neighborhood looked like. Sounds like a, a good a good project, certainly. Yeah. So good luck. Um, Robert asks about privacy laws restricting access. And is that, again, something that varies from city to city, state to state? And how do you learn about access and uh, privacy laws that would govern access to these records? Yes, that is privacy laws are dependent on state, sometimes a county level. Typically, the state is set at the state level. Um, in Massachusetts, there is no uh, privacy restriction to getting records um, besides amended records. Uh, in New York, um, there are rules for, I think it's 125 years now for birth records, and that is at both New York City and New York State, even though they keep their records separately. It's a New York State law. Um, Washington State, it is, it is open. So you could get a Seattle record. It's a little, their application process a little bit trickier. Um, but those privacy rules are normally set at the state level. Um, but then you would need to turn to, like, for example, Seattle. I believe that you can get a vital record from both the city, but also from Kings County, which is the county that Seattle's in, um, if I'm remembering right. All right, so it varies. <laughs> um, it always is different. It, yeah, it's always different. It always varies. It depends. Um, uh, Susan asks, are there any good sources for jail records or institutional records? I can answer that specific to Massachusetts. If it's a state prison, it's at the state archives. Um, if it, I'm not quite sure how that, it would break down for, I'm not quite sure the history of prisons in um, Massachusetts, where if there is a prison that was controlled, let's say by the city of Boston, if those records would be at the city archives. But I definitely know that if your ancestor was at a state prison, those records are held by the Massachusetts State Archives. Any record that was, that is that was made by the state government of Massachusetts is at the Massachusetts State Archives. There are some pretty strong um, privacy laws when it comes to those records, I believe dependent on their age. 
Um, but I definitely would reach out to the reference archivist there. They do this all the time and uh, can definitely help you. Uh, now, Susan asks, do you have any suggestions for finding information on a single person who was a servant for our hotel in Manhattan in the early 1900s, you know, besides looking at city directories and censuses, what other records might you be looking at or for um, to find an individual, say, um, who was a servant or a domestic, uh, in this case, at a hotel? I can't think of anything off the top of my head because those aren't, they're not, they're, they wouldn't show up in civic records um, for their profession. Uh, uh, depending on the hotel, if a hotel kept employment records, maybe a hotel is busy um, and as big as, let's say, the Park Plaza, maybe they do have an archivist there. I wouldn't be surprised and I would like to meet them if they do. Um, but I feel like it'd be pretty hard to kind of paint that your ancestors world um, because those you didn't that kind of occupation didn't leave a lot of records behind to look at. So be, besides city directories, um, and I don't know if a, if a person working in a hotel would even show up in a city directory. I think that's a tricky one. I definitely uh, would look into the history of the hotel, I think, whatever you can learn about that hotel. Um, so that's even going local than the, more local than the borough. Uh, see what you can find out about the hotel and if it's still around and where its records would have gone if it closed down. Um, just a few more questions before wrapping up. Uh, Michelle asks, where can we find uh, that streetcar map of Los Angeles? I think you showed a, a streetcar or a trolley map of Los Angeles um, earlier on in your presentation. Um, if you're looking for transit maps, uh, what might be a good spot to look at? I believe that map uh, I pulled from I believe I pulled it from a Los Angeles uh, Historical Society site. Uh, I'm not quite, I have it bookmarked on my computer, can definitely provide it to Ginevra to pass along. Um, but off the top of my ha I head, I can't think of that. Transit collections, uh, I know for uh, New, uh, New York and Boston, in New York there is an MTA archivist and uh, many of the MTA is controlled at the government level, at actually at the state level. So I bet a lot of those records would be at the state archives. In, New, uh, in Boston, uh, a lot of those records, would, a lot of those records are at the city archives, the earlier records before the creation of the MBTA. And then the MBTA today has its own archive. Uh, but then there are also collections uh, concerning the T and in Northeastern's library, I'm not quite sure how the provenance of those records, how they ended up at Northeastern, um, but they could really be anywhere. But most uh, transit systems are governmentally operated. So I'd figure out what, if the city runs it, if the county runs it, if the state runs it, um, and when those distinctions were made to find those records. Um, okay, uh, Christine asks, where else would I look for, say, New York City directories other than Ancestry? I think you mentioned archive, um, Internet Archive, which is archive.org. Are there other places that you would look for city directories in particular? The New York Public Library. They have so much on their website and are just slowly, not, I wouldn't say slowly, are quickly digitizing so many things in their collection. Um, I normally use Ancestry for, I just find it easier to navigate for uh, New York City directories, but I definitely would take a look at what the New York Public Library has to offer. Their website is incredible. All right, great. Um, let's see, so uh, another question, where can we get birth, marriage, and death records for Boston? I know registers are on family search with certain information, but are there actual certificates anywhere or licenses for marriages anywhere? So I believe a, I believe it was till 1911. So certificate, birth, marriage, and death certificates, the single page um, with more information on it, those were not created in Massachusetts until 1911. Everything before that is just the register. 
um, big bound books that are line by line um, written down. Uh, there's no uh, coordinating certificate that goes with those registers. Um, those registers up to 1925 are available um, at the at the Ma uh, sorry Massachusetts State Archives, but are available on FamilySearch. Um, they finished their digitization this year. Um, any records after 1925, you have to go to the uh, Massachusetts Vital Records Office, um, which is run by the governor. It's uh, separate than the archives. All right, and uh, Geraldine asks about, um, so she says there, there's often more than one person with the same name living at the same time in big cities like New York City. Uh, immigrants moved often and also changed occupations frequently. Do you have any suggestions for distinguishing, say, my ancestor from other folks who have the same name? And that's the tricky, fun questions that we deal with in genealogy. Um, I would, it, it, I've done spreadsheets before. Well, I will go year by year and mark every single person with that name, their occupation and how that changes their address and track each person until you, until you can mark them off as not not being your ancestor. Uh, it's a lot of work, um, but it's typically the only way to be certain um, of what, of which John Smith is your ancestor living in New York City. Um, it's, I would recommend doing it that way. It's kind of casting a wide net um, and slowly whittling it down. So kind of collecting people by yeah. name and then process of elimination in some regard. Exactly. Yes. All right. Well, thank you again, Danielle. Thank you everyone for your great questions. Unfortunately, that's all the time that we have for today. Um, but if you have more specific questions about your family history research, you may consider uh, hiring our research services team to break down brick walls or do research on your behalf. And then I also want to let you know about um, a newly expanded service, uh, which is a free chat service, free online chat with our genealogists. Uh, that is Monday through Saturday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, the service is free, open to everyone, open to the public, and it can be accessed at AmericanAncestors.org slash chat. So if you have reference questions or um, suggestion, suggestions on where to turn, uh, certainly avail yourself of our free chat service. And again, that's at AmericanAncestors.org slash chat. So thank you again for joining us. As you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback as we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings. Any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. This free webinar was made possible by the generous support of members and friends around the world. Please consider making a gift to American ancestors to keep these programs free and to create more free programs for you and for others. And if you'd like to access more how-to resources or learn about upcoming online educational programs, please visit our online learning center at AmericanAncestors.org slash education. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.